we've addressed that in the past, but uh, let's uh, put it here in video form for those who uh, may be new to it. How to quickly stop a sickle cell crisis, especially for children, but yeah. we can address adults too, please. Yeah, wow. And, and, and sickle cell crisis can come in many forms. I can maybe quickly give a description. Um, as babies, oftentimes it's the hand, the swollen hands and the feet. Mm -hmm. It could be tummy aches, back aches. It could honestly be just anywhere in the body. It could be joints, hands. You know, one point Ruby just said, mom, my hand hurts. And it was just so random. And I soaked it in, in water with Epsom salt and gave her some even flow. And then it went away after 30 minutes. Yeah. But, you know, it was super random. Just her hand was just yeah. kind of, you know, um, painful. So, and this happened to me too. My, both of my arms were swollen and, and uh, very painful. And I only have the sickle cell trait. So don't say only, don't say only, do not True. say only. I have sickle cell trait. My daughter has sickle cell SS and both of us have experienced, you know, crises that we've been able to manage at home really quickly. So I want to know how you would put it into, yeah, again, action steps for someone who is dealing with a crisis, maybe for the first time, how do they quickly stop it and how do they maybe prevent it to in the future? Yeah. The first thing I'll, I'll always tell patients is don't panic. Okay. Um, the, 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 the worst thing you can do is panic and then you're trying to figure out what to do. The action steps are going to be very, very simple it is really figure out why did the, per, did the baby um, have a crisis. You know, dehydration is huge. Um, change in diet. I mean, um, I, I have, have uh, some, some, some young patients that, you know, they, they <laughs> They'll go somewhere and they'll have some ice cream or have something. And next thing you know, the body's producing a lot of inflammation, a lot of mucus. And the body's like, I, I can't do that. And it starts to shut itself down and try to figure things out. And the baby can go into a crisis. Um, or is it just really a matter of now the baby's changing from one phase in life to another? Around seven, eight, nine months, you know, the mom's uh, hemoglobin start to change. And then the baby's only hemoglobin start to be, be produced. That's when I, I really tell people, you know, around that time is when I want them to start, they start on even flow to help sort of support as well. So really figure out why things are happening. Now, the first thing that, you know, I, I want to tell you guys is, you know, the pain, as I said before, is a alarm. Something's not right. You know, things are being clogged up somewhere. So the first thing you want to do, everyone wants to do is always make sure the child is out of pain first and foremost. But given an analgesic, it's not going to get rid of the crisis. First thing you want to do is do something that's going to do some vasodilation. You know, like, like CC said, the Epsom salt, a lot of magnesium, a lot of different trace minerals inside there. That's going to actually open up the capillaries and veins and allow the body to say, okay, let me now relax and get things flowing first and foremost. You know, some warm Epsom salt, uh, a bath can actually just, you know, really help out tremendously. Make sure the child is actually hydrated um, is a major thing as well. Um, the, the child may also just be overheated, especially here in the summer. Um, it's like, uh, you know, wow, I, I'm overheated. Not just dehydrated, I'm just overheated. And now my body is just, is just all inflamed. I, I saw a baby a few days ago and his legs were just so red. And I was like, wow, I, I felt I, I was felt so sorry for this child. Like, like, like the child has a sunburn and the parents are still pushing around with his legs hanging out of the stroller and the sun just banging down on, on, on his legs. And he's wondering why the, the child's not sleeping at night because he's in pain in, in, in that all actuality. So just make sure the child is actually comfortable, especially in the, in the sun, they're covered. I'm not saying put sunscreen on them, put shade, put the, the child in constant um, shade as well. The other thing, and I don't know if it's a question later on, but other thing is like, you know, kids want to go into water, into the pool, changing the temperature, like drastically, it's going to also possibly create a, a strong flow of, of, of blood throughout the body, or it's going to be a shocking effect. And that shocking effect is going to stop the blood flow. So that can actually also create a, a sickle cell crisis. You want to get the child either cool. And when I say cool, I'm not saying rub ice on, on a child. I'm saying cover them up so that the sun's not on them. And also just give them a lot of cool drinks, not cold drinks. And again, that strong temperature change can also internally cause more of an issue. You want to give them 
cool fluids, not ice cold, cool fluids, almost room temperature fluids over and over and over again. And again, don't look at sports drinks. You can make your own sports drink with a little bit of lemon, a little bit of, of Celtic or Himalayan sea salt, you know, stir that up in some um, some water and let them drink that down. That's gonna hydrate them and give them the trace minerals they would need for the body to actually function. Of course, I'm gonna always say the chlorophyll and even flow, always give that to them, have that on hand. The reason why, is designed to actually not just support the body so you won't have a crisis, but when you're in crisis, you can give it every half an hour to every hour or every two hours to give that vasodilation to also help with pain. We have three ingredients in, inside there that their job is to help with pain and also with blood flow throughout the body, open up capillaries and also repairing the capillaries from any damage that's already been done by having that, that crisis in the area as well. That's the purpose of the creation of even flow was to make sure that you are able to have it to maintain, but also making sure that if you have any sort of pain, it's going to help repair as fast as possible. So there's no long term damage as well. So again, hydration, checking to see if the child is too cold or too hot. You're going to make sure that they're not dehydrated and also you know, make also make sure that you're given the even flow um, and also chlorophyll um, either every half an hour, every hour or every two hours, depending on the situation as well. So that's the way I, I say you, you also want to deal with it. If you don't have the, the even flow, the chlorophyll can help, but it's going to take a lot longer. But be careful with the chlorophyll. Chlorophyll can, de, um, can make you constipated if you take too much of it as well. So that's one reason why when people always ask me, well, I can just do the chlorophyll. Yeah, to a point, it can also cause other issues if you take, because the chlorophyll really does, takes a lot of toxins out of the body. And doing that, it, it gathers a lot of water and it can dehydrate the, the intestines. So that's why it even flows a lot better too. That's really good to know. Really, really good to know. And I'll um, I'll add a little, you know, a little testimonial to that too when it comes to crisis. Um, because oftentimes if I say, you know, my daughter's five years old and she's doing well, she's never been hospitalized for a crisis. And, um, you know, what, I'm, what that means is that once in a while, once in a while, not even, I could say maybe maximum three times a year, Ruby might come to me and say, mommy, my back hurts or, you know, uh, my hand, like the, you know, that one time. So what I've come to really learn is like you said, um, if I panic, she will panic and it just makes it worse. Okay. But if I, if I, if I control and manage my emotions in the moment and try to automatically reflect about, okay, what may have caused this and let's address it. Um, it could have been because she came out of the pool because my daughter loves water. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she loves, loves, loves water. She could stay in the bathtub for hours. Um, so if there was a drastic change in temperature, then that makes sense. So I immediately think about hydrating her. If she's cold, I got to keep her warm, you know, um, and the even flow in the chlorophyll every half hour. So that's for sure how we deal with it at home. And it's been very efficient. Again, she's never had to be hospitalized for it. She's never had to take heavy drugs. You know, the one time we thought it was a severe um, crisis because she had a tummy ache for almost three days, it turned out to be a fluoride, uh, how do you call it, intoxication? Yeah, she yeah. had swallowed toothpaste. She swallowed uh -huh. toothpaste and her tummy was hurting her for three days straight. We went to the ER, they couldn't find anything wrong. There was no infection. There was no crisis. Her hemoglobin was fine. Yeah. So it turned out, it turned out to be she had literally swallowed uh, toothpaste. So, yeah. <laughs> and that's the one time she received more morphine mm -hmm. because they thought they thought it was a crisis, and that was the only time that she ever took uh, a drug like that um, for pain. Um, but it wasn't even sickle cell. So, all to say, what you uh, suggest and recommend is actually, it can be done very well and it actually is working for us. So thank you. Yeah. yeah. And, and it, it, the, the piggyback on all of that is parents, please learn your child. You know, um, the amount of patients that I've had in office that I, I will see on a weekly basis, you know, over and over, oh, you know, they're in crisis, they're in pain. I'm like, Okay. And I'm like, no, it's not a crisis. I, I've had at least, I had one, he had a sprint, the, the child actually had a sprained ankle because he didn't tell his, his mom that he was playing, you know, soccer inside of a recess. So he actually had a sprained ankle. 
Um, another one, she ended up having scoliosis. Another one, you know, she was in cheerleading, actually actually had a torn labor in her hip. Um, so it's been so many, you know, like, like false sickle cell crisis. I mean, I have more sickle cell crisis false than I actually have after sickle cell crisis, you know, type thing, and, which is a great thing. And I, and I appreciate that. And the other thing I will say, you know, practitioners, if you have practitioners who are watching this, you know, because someone has sickle cell disease and they come to you, let's not always just point, okay, we have sickle cell disease, this is the protocol for that, and then and push them off to the side. That's not the case. Like, and, and, and all, in all these cases, I've had these, these people actually originally go to the hospital and was in the hospital for a week or two. And then they'll come to me and say, hey, you know, this person been in the hospital for the last two weeks and they're still having pain. I'm like, okay, let, 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 let me really see what's really going on. And most of the time what happens is um, the, it's, it's not a downing of, of, of practitioners, it's more so I just want to educate you. You got to touch your patients sometimes because this, this young man who had a sprained ankle, had gone to the hospital, was in the hospital, came back out, his foot was never touched. It was never x-rayed, it was never looked at, it was never analyzed. It was like, okay, well you, well, you have sickle cell, so there has to be a crisis and you just rolled them off. And the kid had a sprained ankle, a severely sprained ankle, actually. He had a, a partial tear in one of his ligaments. And then the person who had the torn labor in there him. Same thing. I'm like, these are not sickle cell crisis. This, this is real pain. These are real people who are just, they're, they're beyond their diagnosis. You know, you're beyond your diagnosis. So let's continue to look at them as people first and analyze what's really going on. And then if the crisis, okay, great, let's screen for the crisis, but make sure that it's not anything else going on. The young lady who had scoliosis, I mean, she was, it was, I mean, it was an S curve. I'm like, has anyone turned you over and really just palpate your back to see that your back is like, is like an S right now? No. You know, I'm like, okay. And actually I've had many patients uh, with sickle cell disease that actually ended up having scoliosis, you know, either from being in bed too long or it's just being malnutrient and the body is not forming um, the spine properly, whatever it may be, but it's happened. So we have to look at the kid and the adults for what they really have and not who they really are. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and, and on that too, when you say learn your child, it, that's a big one because, um, like even with Ruby, I really had to pay attention, like you said, and, and notice when something could be related to sickle cell or when it's simply just because she's a kid yeah. and she like that probably hurt herself or, you know, uh, it could be totally unrelated to the diagnosis. So that's a really big tip right there is to learn your child and also anticipate what could cause a crisis. And I think this is why this is so useful is because when you know what can cause a crisis, then you can prepare in advance. So if I know my child is gonna be out all day at daycare, I have to make sure that she leaves with a full water bottle every day. Like yeah. I have to make sure that that happens. And when she comes home, I gotta evaluate that water bottle and see yeah. how much of it she drank. Exactly. And if she didn't drink much, I gotta get on it right away and make sure she's hydrated before yeah. she goes to bed. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it's, we constantly have to monitor our kids that way. Um, until they're old enough to do it on their own. But it's definitely that prevention mentality as opposed to waiting for the worst to happen. But if you take control of your health and you, you anticipate what could cause your health to be disrupted, then yeah, you save yourself a lot of headache. And let's say she wants to go to the pool and I know in advance that, you know, let's say she'll, it's a Saturday, she'll go to the pool on Sunday then from Saturday, I can start giving her even flow in the morning, maybe at night. Yeah. And then when she yeah. wakes up the next morning too, right before she gets in the pool, I might give her another dose. When she yeah. comes out of the pool, I'll give her another dose. And before she goes to bed, I can give her a little bit of chlorophyll. You know what I mean? So always making sure that um, her body's prepared for any kind of disruptive behavior, like anything that will shock the body. Like you said, temperature. Temperature is a big one. If it was if it's winter time and she comes home to a very, very hot home, like if my heater was all the way up, I got to keep in mind that, you know, she's coming from very cold to very hot. Like we got to balance that out too, you know? Yeah. So I love all these, uh, all these tips and I hope someone takes away from that. Perfect. Perfect.